What was your inspiration like? Where did you get the idea to change them so radically and then kind of keep the texture of the thing they are? Well, you know, early on, because we were on the show for almost eight months before we actually went to camera, so this was a long discussion, um, but uh, Brian Fuller and the other producers and writers, there was always this desire to, to create a new Klingon look, because we felt like it was sort of something that had happened between... TOS and Next Gen happened for TOS and the films, and so it was a natural step to take in the Star Trek universe. So when you're coming up with a new show, that back with the fact that this is really the first Trek where we're dealing with the problems that HD creates, and, and those problems combined with the sophisticated audience eye means you have to come up with something even more hyper real to make people believe it. So we wanted to do this with a keen eye on honoring the integrity of everything that, that's come before us and we all love, I grew up on it and, and love the Westmore versions and James worked on these versions so we wanted to keep enough of it there that it resonated and, and felt like Klingon but to take it as far as we could into the realm of realism and evolve the design to its its next step. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> it's unanimous. I wanted to ask about Arium. Um, like, what are her augments, and does she have any special abilities? Oh. What can you tell us about her? I would love to tell you about that. And I, I think that's a Gretchen and Aaron question, actually. But um, you're right. She is an augment, and so um, that's a whole interesting world, isn't it, for all of us Trek? Is, is when when you really get into Klingon in a different way they look. We know that because of Cold Station, that the augments. The reason for the TOS look and the lack of ridges is really because of augment technology and the technology that created Khan and, and, the, and the war. So um, there, that's a, a space between that is really cool to play in. So we do this with a lot of our stuff, not just Arium or the Klingons, but like for the Klingon houses, for instance, one of the things I look forward to unpacking more is moving forward. I created a cultural axiom document for all the great houses. It doesn't mean it will be written into the show, but when we make design decisions and we show a house, and there's lots more to show, th there are all these cultural axioms I created to give us design impetus as to which planet in the Empire did they grow up on. So in the past, we've always sort of seen a homogenized look to the Klingon and their wardrobe and their hair, give or take. We're trying to make sure that all the houses feel like their own unique thing, because why wouldn't they be? If you look at the cultural patina of all of our cultures, with our architecture, our food, our fashion, our music, on just one measly planet that's not even spacefaring yet, what would the empire's cultures look like? And we're really diving into that, and will be as we go further. So with her, it's one of those things that I can't answer. We have lots of reasons in our head, but you should ask Gretchen and Aaron that question. But she is an augmented human. Okay. It takes four hours for her makeup. That's what I can do. <laughs> <laughs> and, what if, and like, what about Detmer that had a plan that she got after the battle? Is that something that's like, is that another Aaron question? Like, is that keeping her alive? And what it purpose is, is that? And, and it, all, all th those things are really questions because I know more than I should, and I don't want to speak out of turn or shoot me. <laughs> well, that's fair enough. But actually, I mean, that's the thing. It's like. Do you guys get a brief that gives you that information that says, okay, this, this, and this, and then you kind of work with that? Yeah, that design. I can speak to. Okay. So um, when, when I said during the panel that it's, it's the most uh, immersive and, and generous and inclusive creative environment I've ever work, worked in, um, that is nothing short of the truth. So it, it is not common in our department to get this much immersion. It's Aaron and Gretchen and all the writers and producers from day one, we started working on the show almost eight months before we were physically on set. That's unique. Even on a film today, that's incredibly unique. And so, uh, yeah, they, they share ideas before they're even beatboarded, before their outlines, before their scripts. So, and, and then they ask for, and actually mean it, which is a strange thing, Hollywood, your input. And so, and so, <laughs> so <laughs> they'll give us all, all kind of where they're headed and some thoughts that they're kicking around in, in writer room phase before it's even beaded out. And we'll start throwing stuff back at them. And so they'll kind of grab some stuff they like. And then that feedback starts to happen as Nev starts into the digital world. So that, that's a lot. Someday, I really hope all of you guys will get to see that. I think that, that there, there's inexorably an going to be a book 
um, if not a documentary. But Nev's design process is quite massive. So we work in the digital, not just because we're 3D printing things, just for everything. So there's digital designs that come from those conversations. Then we start taking that him and I will talk about it. He'll bang out versions. Then we'll start taking the ones that are most likely maybe doing some physical tests and looking at materials and colors. And um, for the Orions, for instance, we just looked at raw silicone samples. We, we took this demon face that is not part of Star Trek and ran different translucent blue colors to see what the base tone was that really gave it uh, an angelic, uh, almost, um, you, you, you know, uh, this heavenly glow so that when light goes through it and bounces back to your eye, it doesn't look like a dude in blue paint. James could speak to that. So the, the problem is we can do all those things in the lab and make all these cool new techniques work, but he's got to figure out how to get it to blend the skin. Right. Yeah, it was four, four colors. Four colors we have to spatter and spackle on there just to give life and depth to it. Just so it's not a solid blue, solid green, solid any color, any color character. Because that that 3D or that that 4K camera is going to pick up every detail. Like I said on the thing, it's great for NASCAR, but it's not great for. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it's great for us, but it's it's we actually have to work a, lo a lot harder. And also, uh, the prosthetics that I get now with that camera being so sharp, so like Mary in particular having a five-piece prosthetic on, my goal is you not to see all those seams that I have to hide with stippling and coloring. And, and, is, it, and is it still um, kind of a, a process of discovery uh, as you go? Oh, sure. Day in, day out. Hey, is oh, this, is oh this working yeah. Or not? I mean. My, my makeups change throughout the whole season <laughs> in ways that I've I learn every day of a little way of doing it a little differently not not you guys will never see it I see ways of shortening the time putting the paint a little bit to the right which will hide something and, and uh, it's, you know those are those changes that I'll, I'll see and make my job easier make productions uh, job easier because they get the actor on camera more time the less they're in my chair, the more they're on the screen. But HD was just this like technological landmine. No one knocked on the doors of all the makeup effects people and went, no. Three years from now, you're gonna to have to change the way that you do everything because you're gonna invent a new camera. And, and what he says, HD is not good for us. It's it takes away all our secrets. Yeah. So on shows like CSI New York and stuff, where we're doing all this high-end forensic stuff, which we also worked on together. Um, we had to literally throw away all of the molds to the pieces that were in foam because they just no longer work. The mid, there was day one of the season that we changed to, to a red camera and like, that's it. We have to go all silicone with everything because you can see every edge, right? And so it, it takes away a lot of our tricks. So it is a process of discovery. And then each character carries with it its own challenge. No matter how many makeups you've done, the next makeup is the first time you're doing that makeup. And so everything has to be figured out for you for that person and for the way their edges work. And so I know that you've been a Star Trek fan forever. What what kind of aliens from previous iterations of Star Trek would you like to maybe see on Discovery? Is there anything you're dying to make? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Klingons would have been the first answer. Um, and and we got the, off. right, we got the, um, or luckily got to do the Endorians and, and Tellerites. Yeah. So awesome going back to TOS, but Borg, and, and I think it's, just, am I answering yeah. for you, would it be Borg? 